Welcome to the Grim Leftovers Show with Grimnir every Monday night at 7 p.m. Eastern on reallibertymedia.com and rlmradio.xyz. You betcha, kids. It is Monday evening right here, February 10, 2020. Welcome to the Grim Leftovers Show. And hey, somebody remind me after the program, I got to I gotta call my sister. It's her birthday today. Yes, indeed. Hey, sis, happy birthday. I know you're not tuned in, but uh, still. <laughs> All right, I am Grimner. It is uh, February 10th, as I mentioned, 2020, and we are broadcasting live all over the place, all over the place, all the various spots that we go out to. Thank you for the audio check there. Appreciate it very much. Uh, we are there on freedomsnetwork.com live. We are there on realliberty.org live. We're on Shoutcast. We're on reallibertymedia.com. Yeah, imagine that. On, uh, yeah, and you can eat, actually go to the, uh, the show page for the Grim Leftovers program. Or not. Just use the, 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 the audio thing on the side there. Or go to rlmradio.xyz. Oh, so many places, so many places. So, uh, Great, huh? All right, let's say uh, hi and howdy. We got, we got a chat room over here, too. Anybody out there listening that's not tuned in or not here in the chat room, head on over to reallibertymedia.com. Hit the little pop-up chat deal, and you can jump on in here and say hi and howdy to all these folks that come over here and hang out with us. Uh, yeah, we got some good folks here. We got the, uh, well, uh, bots and bodies, as Slash likes to say. Uh, Barman and Beetle and Cowboy Tech, myself and the Mighty Moose Girl. Uh, we got Miss Kate, the lovely Miss Kate, uh, Anti and Asmo, Jalcedoni, and the lovely Miss Circle. Did I say the lovely Moose Girl? Yeah, I did. I, I think I forgot, but yes, the lovely Moose Girl. Uh, we had Echelon and Frumpy and Java Doctor, and oh yeah, the lovely Meister Brow. <laughs> Rob works in Rome's Vanna Whitebot, Vin E. Yes, he's on the heel. He's on the mend. He's on the recuperation mode. So uh, get better there, man. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, whatever it takes. So we got Weather Dork and Phantom and CC66. Joe Skira, the cyborg. Noodle, he is quite the cyborg. Half man, half not man. Um, thanks, Vinny. Uh, and we got E-Man and Ensiv and Gromit. Mr. JJ's over there in the Scotland area. Kiss, Pone Sauce, Mr. Sock Puppet. Yeah, he's a cool dude, man, let me tell you. Uh, we got Smartass, the holiest of Rogers, and Zippix. Zippix. <laughs> did you hear? I don't know what that. Oh, yes, I did hit record. Thank you very much, Kate. <laughs> By the way, as <laughs> we mentioned before I go on, this is February. That means it is donation drive month for reallibertymedia.com, RLM Radio. Dot X Y Z. So if you have a few dollars and you want to send them our way, uh, please do so. And it would be greatly appreciated. Now, uh, as of uh, yesterday morning, Sunday morning, uh, we had only received one donation so far. And, and I was I was not feeling real good about it. But uh, Hal Anthony got on his show yesterday behind the woodshed. Uh, yes, I know, the Wrath of Circle. Uh, so anyway, Hal Anthony got on uh, his show yesterday, uh, at, 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 and, 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 and told people, hey, I'm not gonna be on the air anymore unless somebody comes on here and starts, uh, putting in some cash. And a bunch of people did. A bunch of people put some cash in. But, uh, we're about halfway. We're about halfway where we need to be, cash-wise. Other people donate in various other ways. And some people donate monthly, like Miss Graham Z. She she pays for our Spreaker account every month. And Mr. Vin E, he he, he sends a, a monthly tithe. <laughs> I don't know if that's the proper word. Uh, for um, just because he's he's that kind of guy, Vin E. Does stuff, man. He does broadcasts. He does reaching out to people. He bringing hosts and and guests and uh, you know, Vinny may rub some people the wrong way, but damn, he's a good guy, Dan. He's he's my brother, brother Vinny. All right, anyway, 
And other people that I'm not going to mention do lots of things for the, for the RealLibertyMedia.com in lots of ways. And let, let me mention the host, so Hal Anthony, his show, Behind the Woodshed. That, that's a big, big draw over here. People love Hal Anthony, Behind the Woodshed, and, and the stuff that he talks about. Uh, we got Flash, Flash Somebody, and, and his wonderful wife. You know, I, I don't think Flash would be here if it weren't for Circle. So, Circle, you're awesome. Uh because <laughs> Flash does a lot. He does a lot. He does, he does two regular shows. He used to do three. He may be doing another one coming up. I, I think that was kind of a little message, but he, he, nothing. I, we'll see about that. Um, <laughs> yeah, we got Prince and Zippix and and Rotten Socks. They do their show on on Thursday nights. We got Lonnie Clark. Lonnie Clark doing a regular weekly show here now. Now, now she does it a little differently than others, but that's all right. Her show comes through. Last week's show, if you haven't heard that podcast, go back and check it out. That, that to me, was her best show yet, at least to, uh, as far as Real Liberty Media goes. She's been doing shows for a while, a couple of few years, uh, but she just recently joined over here at Real Liberty Media. So, hooray for Lonnie and hooray for Vinny bringing her on over. Um <laughs> no worries there, Rob Works. We got Dan. Hey, Dan, how you doing? Um, uh, we, we, <laughs> Miss Moose Girl, Moose Girl. We, me, and Moose Girl have been doing the Freakers Ball show for eleven years. Uh, and, and I mean, how awesome can that be? Um, so all of the hosts here uh, on RealLibertyMedia.com just <laughs> hooray for them all. Uh, I, I love the ball. Did I miss any? But did I forget someone? I may have. <laughs> if, I, if I forgot you, I'm sincerely sorry. <laughs> uh, but I was just kind of breezing through what I have. But, you know, we got we got so many great people here. Um, that not only the ones that hang out in the chat and they, they contribute in that way, and a lot of times stuff people contribute in the chat, I, 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 I uh, use that for, for various shows that I do. Well, you know, for this show in the figures ball. Um, but yeah, so, uh, hooray for them all. And, and as I said, and, and just, you know, if you have a few dollars, please send them our way. Cause we need, we need money to, to keep things up and running and operating here, uh, for, for the radio shows. So appreciate it. Appreciate it very much. All right. Enough of that nonsense. Let's get on to the stories. Now, I, I <laughs> I was thinking about this as I was setting up the stories for this week, putting the line, lining up the shows. Um, and somebody's got it out there, you know, that, that does like some songwriting or whatever. And this is maybe a good song title for you. Maybe like a, a folk song or, or, or something like that. Three weeds and a mushroom. Yeah, sing it, sing it. Three weeds and a mushroom. Ba ba ba. <laughs> anyway, just you'll catch on as I go through here. <laughs> hey, Prince, how you doing? Oh boy. Okay, let's kick it off here on rxleaf.com. And I, like this guy, am not really happy about what's going on. Cannabis researcher angry that all of the research with all the research that we have currently in our hands, we're still not saying cannabis treats cancer. What about we? I mean, I say that. But they don't. They don't. They don't. Thanks, Rob. Uh, Dr. Bob Melamede is a key cannabis advocate with doctoral degrees in biochemistry and molecular genetics. His computer has 13,000 cannabis research articles on it. A thousand of them which demonstrate the anti-cancer power of cannabis. That pisses him off. Dr. Bob Melamede would want you to know that there is a human perception problem that we all suffer from. It's known as bias. The brain will take one word and rapidly generate the imagery, vocabulary, and ideas needed to support and comprehend the bias. For example, stoner. Huh. Most people immediately formed the image of 
overweight, 20-something male sitting on a beat-up couch in his parents' basement watching TV and eating Cheerios. Cheetos. <laughs> Maybe eating Cheerios, too. I don't know. This stereotype is so heavily ingrained in our cultural bias that even the greatest cannabis advocate likely held some variation in his or her brain when they cued with the word stoner. However, this is not an accurate portrayal for people who regularly consume cannabis. Do those types of stereotypes exist? abs freaking lutely But the overwhelming majority of stoners use cannabis as a medicine and as a tool to improve their lives. And let me just pause there and say, I saw a uh, tweet by Tommy Chong yesterday. And if you want to picture stoner, you kind of picture Tommy Chong, Keeson Chong. Yeah. Uh, uh, anyway, it said that all cannabis use is medical. And it actually is. Whether you realize it or not, whether you think of it that way or not, all cannabis use is medical. These people are happy, balanced, healthful, healthy, full-functioning adults who contribute to society on a daily basis. Is Dr. Bob Melamede a stoner? Dr. Bob Melamede has a doctoral degree in biochemistry and molecular genetics. Would you expect that he also consumes enough cannabis e uh, each day to plant most consumers on their faces? Probably not. But his story is one of reality, uh, compared to the bias of what a stoner looks like. Dr. Bob is an advocate for cannabis, a leader in the industry that's long been held underground, and a man with a passion for healing with plants. The charismatic, well-thought, mustachioed gentleman believes in endocannabinoid system, uh, which exists in our bodies, for a good reason. He says that he's always wanted to know what life is, and through that pursuit, he has discovered the vast importance of our endocannabinoid system. He speaks to its importance with a number of homeostatic systems, cardiovascular, muscular, digestion, stress responses, and more. And I got a little chart here of the human endocannabinoid system showing you CB1 and CB2. CB1 is beneficial to the brain, the lungs, the vascular systems, the muscles, the gastrointestinal tract, and reproductive organs. CB2 is good for the spleen, the bones, and the skin. And when you combine those two, it boosts up the immune system, helps the liver, helps the bone marrow, helps the pancreas. Dr. Bob on the endocannabinoid system. In his own words, he says that the endocannabinoid system is the thermostat of our own bodies. It's a regulatory system that ensures our bodies function correctly and respond to their environment in the same way a thermostat responds to the environment of our homes. Of course, the endocannabinoid system creates its own version of cannabinoids, but we can find additional inputs from plants, such as cannabis. Uh, these additional inputs have a wide variety of documented health benefits for, such human, uh, for humans, such as pain relief, reduced anxiety, improved sleep outcomes, and many, many more. Perhaps the most important health benefit of cannabis, as Dr. Bob says, it is a very clear, unambiguous, cancer-killing ability. Cancer-killing ability. Spicoli, yeah, there you go, Kate. Um, yeah, definitely, that's what you think of when you hear the word stoner. Uh, or yourself. You may think of yourself. The dude. <laughs> exactly. All right. <laughs> You may just say, hey, I know that, that, that stoner, that's me there in the mirror. All right. So Dr. Bob is pissed off because he can access 12,000 to 13,000 scientific articles on his computer in a month's, moment's notice, with nearly a thousand of them pointing to the anti-cancer effects of cannabis. Yet the government says there isn't enough research on its efficacy. What has him even more upset is the United States government still labels cannabis as a Schedule I drug. This means that it has zero medicinal value. 
Furthermore, Schedule 1 status impedes research into its use. So, as a man with doctoral degrees and how the human body works and years' experience dealing with cannabis, it disappoints Dr. Bob that the government will not let people heal with a plant. To, it's easy to assume that stoners are simple-minded, lazy people the media feeds us. But most of them are more like the people who use coffee in the morning before work and exercise in the evening before having dinner with their families. Cannabis is a plant that provides countless benefits to consumers, uh, to its consumers. And those consumers are just as productive as any other subset of people in our society. Dr. Bob Melamed sees injustice. Dr. Bob sees injustice in the Western world. He sees ignorance and propaganda infecting our minds. And he sees people behind bars for a lifetime because they consumed an herb. And most importantly, he sees the role of cannabis in providing people with healthy, happy lives. Dr. Bob is a big advocate for taking charge of our own health through cannabis. Uh, and cannabis is one one more <laughs> cannabis is one important way to achieve that. <laughs> A little tongue tied there. I get excited over the whole cannabis thing. You know, it's a it's an exciting thing to me. Yet our bias makes us see a plant that creates lazy, thoughtless zombies of its consumers. Doctor Bob does not like that idea, and he's working at changing it. <laughs> So, hooray for you, Dr. Bob. Uh, there's a there's a podcast of his at the bottom you can listen to if you want. But uh, three cheers for Dr. Bob and uh, getting out there and, and, and helping helping everybody. Maybe when you think of the word stoner, you think of this guy. This guy here. Willie Nelson joined the fight against the corporate takeover of the cannabis industry. Uh, this posted up here on philipschneider.com uh, a couple weeks ago. Oh, January 14th. All right. <laughs> As marijuana becomes legal across the country, a select few companies have come to dominate the market with some bad business practices. But Willie is trying to stop them. 35 years ago, as Willie was playing his music at Live Aid, a benefit concert for those affected by the famine in Ethiopia, he had the idea for a benefit concert that supports local farmer, farmers. But Bob Geldof, the organizer of Live Aid at the time, thought that his uh, proposal was a crass, stupid, and nationalistic conflation of the two issues. As Willie listened to him downplay the importance of farmers affected by a drought, bankruptcy, and corporate takeover of their industry, it only solidified his desires to start his own concert. Thus, Farm Aid was born. In their first year, Farm Aid included such artists as Johnny Cash and B.B. King and raised over $9 million for down-and-out American farmers. We were losing like 300 farmers a week to suicide, Nelson recalls, but there are things are a little bit better now. Uh, people have started thinking about buying and growing sustainably. Since Farm Aid began, uh, a paradigm shift has occurred. People are now talking about sustainable agriculture, permaculture, and organic food. And the likes of big tobacco, big agriculture, and big biotech have become stains on the American identity. Willie Nelson, as much as a player in his cultural shift as anybody, uh, but he knows that the battle isn't over. Oh, far from over. In recent years, Willie has set his sights on something very near and dear to him. Marijuana. As a lifelong marijuana smoker, Willie Nelson has a deep concern about the way cannabis is grown and distributed. Out of his passion for weed came the startup company Willie's Reserve. A company started by Willie and investor Andrew Davison that seeks to bring social responsibility into the pot market. 
I really believe in the environmental aspects of this. It's a great way to revitalize small farms, and I want to make sure that any product we grow is as clean as we can make it, and that wherever possible, we're trying to lower the environmental impact of our operations. Andrew Davis on Willie Nelson's response to his proposal. The legalization movement was founded on the values of justice, liberty, and health. Many people, often disproportionately black, have been thrown in jail for victimless crimes related to cannabis. Although marijuana is now legal to smoke in many places, it's not always legal to grow or sell. In order to do so, you must get a medical permit or a cannabis business license, respectively, in which the government is handing out very few. It looks a lot like the concentration of capital that we have seen with big alcohol and big tobacco. It's that problematic for, for cannabis law reformers because it plays into our opposition's strongest argument. Uh, that was by Alice, Allison Holcomb, the drafter of the original cannabis legalization law in Washington State. Big Pot has also been using harmful pesticides none of which cannabis activists and consumers ever desired to smoke. Prior to legalization, black market growers typically would not use any pesticides at all because the, the, the quantity of plants tended to be low. But when you in, you're investing millions of dollars in large cultivation center, you can bet they are not going to take the risk of their crop getting wiped out by mold, mildew, or insects. Oddly enough, there are no, no chemicals approved for use on a cannabis plant. This tends to mean, however, that companies are using whichever chemicals they freaking well want to, without any oversight. Oh, thanks for that link there, Cyborg. Um, and Kate, and yeah, both of y'all. Dr. Bob and Willie's Reserve. Cool. Uh, these chemicals include Avid... Fluoromite, mycobutanil, and impacloparide, I don't know, which Professor, Entomo Professor of Entomology, Colorado State University, uh, Whitney Cranshaw claims, actually develops more mites on the plants. To make matters worse, labels such as clean and natural have a striking resemblance to big food term, all natural and that there are very few regulatory requirements resulting in meaningless labeling used solely to market products as less dangerous than they actually are. Although Uncle Willie uh, has recently announced his retirement as a weed smoker, he is still in charge of his company and is rumored to take edibles frequently. Chomp them on down. However, he stated uh, before that that he doesn't like edibles that much. But, you know, if you're not smoking and you got some edibles, then hey, hey. He said, I had a bad experience the first time I did it. That was 50 years ago. I ate a bunch of cookies and I lay there all night thinking the flesh was falling off my bones. Poor Willie. That was, that was a rough night for you. Uh, Willie's Reserve empowers local farmers by allowing them the Willie's Nelson branding in exchange for particular rules they must follow, such as restrictions on pesticide use and that they must be small companies. This ensures quality weed and empowers small businesses seeking to compete with big names like Privateer Holdings and Diego Pellicier, whatever that is. They, the consumers, want to know where the product comes from, from. They want to know it's clean and cared for. They want to know that it's local grown and that it has a connection to their community. I was also Andrew Davison. What Willie has another enemy in the in the pot industry. GMO marijuana. And one of the biggest moves to consolidate power in the cannabis industry to date, Bear and Monsanto are Mon which Bear is Monsanto now, but whatever, are maneuvering to take over the cannabis industry with genetically modified strains, which you can only grow if you have a license for their seeds from their company. These problems could have been fixed on the first day, 
But you have a lot of bureaucracy and bullshit. A lot of big corporations. So that's what we're up against. They're trying to monopolize it all. That's horseshit. That ain't right. And we'll do everything we can to keep it from happening. Willie Nelson. Thank you, Willie. Love you, brother. Another brother. A brother in weed, indeed. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, philipschneider.com. All right. Okay. Weed number three. I like weed. You like weed. Most people like weed. We got it. You know, there's somebody out there that have never tried it and hate it on a ethical basis, I guess. I, I don't know. They, they've they never done it. they never tried it, and they just hate it because they have that, that, that stoner image that he was talking about, at, at, uh, Dr. Bob was talking about there at the beginning of his article. Um, so they, they, they hate weed, or their political party tells them to hate weed, or their religious institution tells them to hate weed, whatever. So there's certain people out there that just don't like weed. But I like weed, and you like weed, and everybody should like weed. You know who really loves weed? Bees. Bees love weed. <laughs> Almost as much as we do. This is posted on MaryJane.com uh, by Randy Robinson back on December 12th. So a new study of America's fledgling hemp farms demonstrated that bees flock to cannabis due to the amount of the, 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 the plant's abundant pollen stores, which could help scientists better support both bee and floral populations. Bees love hemp, and hemp could help farmers grow other cash crops, a new st uh, study concluded. A study led by researchers at Cornell University and published last week in the Environmental, uh, environmental Entomology found that bees are strongly attracted to hemp crops. Its findings agree with a Colorado study published earlier this year that discovered the same thing. Here's what the latest study found. The greater the area covered by hemp, the greater the number of bees attracted to the area. Additionally, taller hemp plants increased the chances bees visited the plots, with the tallest plants bringing in 17 times more bees than the shortest plants. And as the study's uh, time went on, more bees increasingly visited hemp plots, indicating that bees... We're letting their hives know where the good shit was. Now for the strange thing. Cannabis does not produce nectar. The sweet, sugary liquid secreted by many floral varieties to attract insects. Insects. Nor do most hemp flowers come in a wide variety of bright colors, which also attracts insects. The researchers discovered that 16 bee subspecies flock to hemp crops and this was likely due to the pollen produced by male flowers, which it, what exactly made the hemp pollen so enticing remains unknown. Bees also seem uninterested in female flowers, uh, the ones that you and I desire the most, since female flowers do not produce the pollen. The rapid expansion of the hemp production in the U.S. may have significantly significant implications for an agro-ecosystem-wide pollination dynamics. Uh, the study's author concluded, as a late-season crop flowering during a, second, uh, during a period of seasonal floral dearth, hemp may have a particularly strong potential to enhance pollinator populations and subsequent pollination services for crops the following year by filling gaps in late-season resource scarcity. So what does all that mean? Well, what's the point? What are you getting at? Bees are one of the most important, if not the most important, managed pollinators in U.S. agriculture. Spreading one flower's male sex cells to the corresponding female flowers, facilitating plant reproduction, the United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization estimated that worldwide pollinators are worth anywhere from 235 to 577 billion for their role in global crop production, with bees responsible for at least 20 billion of that estimation in just the United States alone. Anyway, it goes on and on here, but uh, 
You get the idea. Bees like weed. They like hemp. You like weed, like hemp. You should probably like bees. Bees are good. Plants are good. So, there you go. <laughs> So, so the uh, the final stage of the folk song I mentioned, the mushroom, <laughs> and this story is it's a sad story really, uh, but it's posted up here on marijuanamoment.net on uh, January twentieth. Company gets trademark for the word psilocybin, frustrating decriminalization advocates. Yeah, as uh, psilocy psychedelics reform effort pick up across the United States, there is an increasing wariness among advocates about the potential corporatization, just like Willie was worried about with the weed, that may follow. That's why many found it alarming when a California-based company announced on Thursday that it had successfully trademarked the word psilocybin, the main psychoactive constituent of so-called magic mushrooms. Psilocybin, trademark, is a brand of chocolates that do not contain the psychedelic itself, but are meant to begin educating, enlightening, and support, supporting the community and upgrading their inner vibrations in order to get everything they want of their time here on Earth, according to their mission statement. Soon after founder Scarlett Ravin shared news of the trademark on LinkedIn, advocates raised questions and concerns. What does that mean on a practical level for other psilocybin organizations? Why should one brand get the exclusive rights, to a certain legal extent, to the scientific name of a natural substance? The reality of this particular trademark is more nuanced than it might appear at first glance. While it is true that the company was granted the distinction by the U.S. Patent and Trademark Office, it's specifically for educational materials, and it's listed on the supplemental register rather than the principal register, which means it would be incumbent upon the brand to prove that it has earned distinctiveness of the mark if the issue would to court. It's certainly good for her business to have that mark, but I think at the end of the day, it's going to be somewhat weak, Larry Sandell, an intellectual property attorney at Me Park LLP, told Marijuana Moment. He added that this example is indicative that people are trying to stake claims early to the IP. What are you doing there? Oh. Yes, bees love weed. All bunch of us weed. Oh, should I wash? I don't know what they're talking about. All right. <laughs> Even if they might be somewhat overreaching, people see a potential new market here, and they want to stake out the ground, he said. It's a big next space that people are anticipating a legal market. Maybe it's where cannabis was five or ten years ago. Despite those legal limitations, reform advocates view the trademark as emblematic of a bigger issue, that someone would presume to take ownership of a substance that's at the center of a national debate on whether or not to criminalize individuals for using it. Kevin Matthews, who led the successful cam campaign in, uh, to decriminalize psilocybin mushrooms in Denver last year and is the founder of the National Psychedelics Advocacy Group, SPORE, told Marijuana Mo <laughs> I was unaware of SPORE prior to this. SPORE! Yeah, yeah. He, anyway, he told Marijuana Moment that he didn't doubt Ravin had the right intentions to promote education into the substance, but he said the decision to trademark is nonetheless questionable. This being an open source movement, trademarking the word psilocybin, in some ways it feels like, although I don't think it's her intention, it's lacking perspective, he said. Does that mean we can't use psilocybin as a spore? Because, as spore, because we're an educational nonprofit and she's a for profit branded company? It doesn't make a lot of sense. She needs to let go of the trademark. 
Raven said that her global trademarking psilocybin was to prevent the substance from becoming the next cannabis, which she said has been corrupted from its true spiritual medicinal benefits and turned into a corporate commodity. Knowing that psilocybin is going to be next to be legalized, I feel strongly guided by the deepest part of my heart to really offer a sense of education of what could be when you take such a strong, beautiful medicine and to give people an education platform here and now and to let them know what's coming, how to receive it, how to get the most benefit from it, she told Marijuana Moment in an interview. Yeah, I, I don't know. It, it's a. I, I'm I'm not a fan of trademarks or patents in the first place. Um, copyrights. Yeah, I don't, I don't really like any of that. Um, and, and if you'll notice, like if you go over to like YouTube and you look at all the uh, uh, the videos that I have posted over there, hundreds and hundreds of videos over there um, uh, that are posted on YouTube, they're all set as. Um, Com, uh, creative Commons license, meaning anybody can use any of them or any part of them for any reason they want whatsoever. I will not. You don't even have to, to reference Real Liberty Media if you use some of our stuff. It's free to go. Take it as you will. We may have spent thousands and thousands of hours uh, creating creating all this content, but you want to use it, go ahead. Um, if you want to you th throw some money our way for for your use of it, feel free to do that. But feel 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 uh, no compulsion to do anything other than use it if that if that is your desire. So um, I, yeah, so I, you know trademarking and this stuff. But uh, maybe it's true. If she didn't trademark that, even in the limited manner that she trademarked it, uh, maybe somebody evil, probably somebody evil, would have gone ahead and trademarked it. I don't know. I don't even know you could trademark a specific word that type of word it's not her word that word doesn't actually belong to anybody <laughs> all right robots robots <laughs> science alert dot com january 14th 2020 michelle star Scientists have built the first ever robots constructed entirely out of living cells. In another lifetime, if they had been allowed to follow their natural development, the stem cells taken from embryonic frogs would have turned into skin and heart tissue with living within living, breathing animals. Excuse me. Instead, in configurations designed by algorithms and constructed by humans, those cells have been assembled into something new. The first ever robots constructed entirely out of living cells. <laughs> Rob. <laughs> the creators have called them xenobots, tiny sub-millimeter sized blobs containing between 500 and 1,000 cells that have been able to scoot across a Petri dish, self-organize, and even transport minute payloads. This sounds so familiar. Have I covered this already? Maybe I covered it on Freakers and I forgot to unmark it. I don't know. Uh, anyway, uh, these xenobots are unlike any living organism or organ we've encountered uh, or created to date. The possibilities for custom living machines designed for a variety of purposes for targeted drug delivery to environmental remediation are pretty mind-blowing. These are novel living machines, said computer scientist and roboticist Joshua, Joshua Bongard, Bongard of the University of Vermont. <laughs> That's a great name, Bongard. <laughs> They're neither traditional robot nor a known species of animal. It's a new class of artifact, a living, programmable organism. Designing the Xenobots required the use of a supercomputer and an algorithm that could virtually put together a few hundred frog heart 
and skin cells in different configurations, kind of like Legos, and simulate the results. The scientists would assign the desired outcomes, such as locomotion, and the algorithm would create uh, candidate designs aimed to produce the outcome. Thousands of configurations of cells were designed by the algorithm with varying levels of success. The least successful configurations of cells were tossed out, and the most successful were kept and refined until they were about as good as they were going to get. Then, the team selected the most promising designs to physically build out of cells harvested from the embryonic African clawed frogs. Uh, this was painstaking work using microscopic forceps and an electrode. When they were finally put together, the configuration were actually able to move around as per the simulations. The skin cells act as sort of a scaffolding to hold everything together, while the contractions of the heart cell muscles are put to work to propel the xenobots. These machines moved about on an aqueous environment for up to a week without the need for additional nutrients. Powered by their own preloaded energy stores in the form of lipids and proteins. One design had a hole through the middle in an attempt to reduce drag. This hole could be expanded into a pouch for transporting objects. Uh, the team found as they evolved in design, they incorporated the pouch and transported an object in simulation. Anyway, it goes on here, but uh, quite, quite interesting. Quite interesting. Um, this is a, like a first step in something possibly really good or possibly really evil. Evil! Oh, but maybe good. <laughs> All right. All right. <laughs> uh, not necessarily my favorite article of the day, but definitely my favorite headline of the day. <laughs> Oh, man. <laughs> On futurism.com, December 9th, 19, it just says 19, I don't know what year, 19 something. December 9th, 19 something. <laughs> so a while ago, yet here we are. Okay, futurist predicts the end of the world as we know it. <laughs> as jobs are automated out of existence, the division between the very wealthy and the very poor will grow, and any notion of a comfortable middle class will vanish. Well, he's right so far. That's according to Ro Roe Tazuz Tuzana, Tuzana, uh, a future studies researcher at in Tel Aviv at Tel Aviv University, according to Haaretz. That stands in contrast to the common argument that new jobs will emerge as others vanish, painting a grim picture for the workforce and global economy. Survival wages. To Zana argues that the jobs that tend to survive automation are low paying, according to Haaretz. Yeah, he's still right meaning that as companies generate increased wealth, almost none of it ends up in the pockets of workers. Still correct. Instead, more people are stuck living paycheck to paycheck, even if unemployment rates are technically low. Still right. Uh, this figure is the end of the world for the average people, Tazana said speaking about the growing gap between labor productivity and wages. It reflects a rather depressing picture. The state and the economy are advancing by storm, but you, lowly workers, are almost not benefiting from this progress and are left way behind. It's almost a catastrophe? Uh, the end result... <laughs> A society defined by pockets of extreme wealth, but otherwise dominated by you folk. People who barely have enough to get by. 
Yeah, that's uh, it, it <laughs> this this is the case. This is the case. Um, and, and if you look around, I mean, you, you'll see it all over the place. Whether it's like at your grocery store or uh, department store, where they have the automatic checkouts now uh, that just eliminated some people, or in in some of the fast food places where they got automatic burger flippers going on there, or in in the hotels where they got like these electronic um, room service things that come up, or all, all these automated cars that are that are delivering pizzas now, uh, or just in your factory. So much, so many of the processes are now automated. Um, so is it Teotihuacan? Teotihuacan? The end of the world as we know it? <laughs> or is it not? Um, and and if, if these people all out there complaining, we want more money to flip this burger or to pour that coffee, well, they don't need you. That, that's the thing, is they don't need you. And... A lot of people, myself included, would rather not deal with these snotty-faced little pukes at at various places I, I may go to, because they are not helping us. They are not providing benefit to my experience as a customer in their their establishment. So if I could just deal with a machine there instead, all the better. And if if the the, the stuff I I may buy is prepared by a machine instead of some snot-nosed punk um, wiping his germs on whatever or spitting in the milkshakes is not something I heard of recently. Um, <laughs> so all the better. The, the more times you can eliminate humans, the better. However, not the better for humans necessarily. Uh, so is it? The end is the world as we know it. Has this futurist seen correctly um, and what he has stated? There's a link at the bottom of that article that goes to a much longer version of the article over on Heretz.com. You can follow it through if you like and, and uh, get all of his views on these things. But, man, I'm telling you, if you think you're doing your basically no-talent job <laughs> is is uh and you out there complaining that you want more of this more of that you want better benefits you want all this different stuff and you don't know anything you don't know anything you could be replaced by a machine in a second shut the hell up do your damn job <laughs> or or better off learn something that a machine can't do and uh go that direction with it because you know man I'm telling you. <laughs> All right. <laughs> this next article. <laughs> funny. Funny, funny, funny. On Fox61.com, posted January 18th. Oh, man. I wonder if blind people do that if they're like, there's no sound. But All right. Deaf man sues Pornhub, claiming a lack of closed captions is discrimination. Yeah. Yeah. Because you got to hear them grunts and moans in order to enjoy your porn. I didn't hear that woman grunt or moan. <laughs> I want to hear her grunt. So a man, a New York man, is suing Pornhub's parent company, MindGeek, for allegedly failing to provide proper closed captions for deaf and hearing impaired pornography consumers. You, you're a Lofsuris, who is deaf, says he was denied equal access to titles such as Sexy Cop Gets Witness to Talk, Hot, uh, hot Step Aunt Babysits Disobedient Nephew, and other videos on MindGeek sites, Pornhub, RedTube, and YouPorn, according to a court filing with the Eastern District of New York. 
without closed captioning, deaf and hard of hearing people can't enjoy the video content on the defendant's website while the general public can. Are you really tuning in for the dialogue? Are you really watching that porn so you can get that that all important script thrown your direction? <laughs> I'm guessing not. <laughs> the Brooklyn man's attorney noted in the filing that uh, hearing impaired Pornhub viewers would also like to access premium, 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 and subscription content, but it wouldn't be worth it without closed captioning. The website, uh, numerous videos, which cannot be accessed by deaf and hard of hearing individuals, well, they can be accessed. You just can't hear it with their grunting, uh, which cannot be accessed by deaf and hard of hearing individuals are in violation of the Americans with Disabilities Act, uh, the New York uh, and New York laws. The court document reads: videos include most uh, include most of the website's videos, in addition to the videos the plaintiff tried to access uh, tried to access mentioned herein. We understand that Yaroslav Suris is suing Pornhub for claiming we've denied the deaf and hearing impaired access to our videos. While we do not generally comment on active lawsuits, we'd like to take this opportunity to point out that we do have closed captions category. So you can read while you're getting off. Yeah, baby! <laughs> <laughs> yeah, instead of one-handed typing, it's one-handed reading, I guess. I, I, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Oh, God. All right. Oh, I thought I closed this one. All right, well, I guess I included it. Uh, is, is, is it in my list? Did I, did I include it in my list here? Okay, I did. I know it's, it's it's tough following that. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Oh, oh. <laughs> That's very difficult. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> this this was posted. This was posted on um, January twentieth. So it's not the coronavirus. Let me emphasize, not. The coronavirus. And you heard me cough just now. I also do not have the coronavirus. Just to let you know. <laughs> oh, God. On PressTV.com. SARS-like virus spreads in China. Nearly 140 new cases. Again, this was on January 20th. I haven't heard anything of it since then. But there it is. There it is. A mysterious SARS-like virus has killed a third person and spread around China, including to Beijing, authorities said Monday, fueling fears of a major outbreak as millions begin traveling for the Lunar New Year uh, in, in humanity's biggest migration. The new coronavirus strain, first discovered in the central city of Wuhan, has caused alarm because of its connection to SARS, which killed nearly 650 people across the mainland of China, Hong Kong, in 2002-2003. Wuhan has, or had anyway, 11 million inhabitants and serves as a major transport hub, including during the annual Lunar New Year holiday, which begins later this week. It actually began on February 4th. That was the start of the year of the rat, the metal rat, thank you very much. Um... Non-human-to-human -human transmission has been confirmed so far, but authorities have previously said the possibility cannot be excluded. A third person was confirmed to have died and 136 new cases were found over the weekend in Wuhan. Uh, I think they've conflated this, but it seems like, and I, I, thought, I, like I, said, I thought I'd close this article because it, it lacked some logic, uh, some of the things they were saying. Um, yeah, because it started off, or when I first read it, it was a SARS type thing, and now and now they've just said, no, 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 make no mind of that. This is this is still part of the corona. 
I, I'm just going to give you the link to the article. And, uh, you can read it if you like. Um. <laughs> That's right, Cyborg. <laughs> No, Grimnir, the non-genetically modified and coronavirus-free personality. All right, so there you go for that. that, that that's, all, that's all good and fine. Okay, but speaking of uh, <laughs> speaking of China, <laughs> the 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 leader of China is called Xi Jinping. Facebook did a little translation on his name, Mister Xi Jinping, and and the, and the translation came out as. Mr. Shithole. <laughs> Mr. Shithole. That's one crappy computer glitch. Facebook was forced to apologize Saturday after a technical issue caused Chinese leader Xi Jinping's name to appear as Mr. Shithole when translated from Burmese to English in posts on its platform, the company said. The blunder was noticed on the second day of Z's visit to the country to sign infrastructure-related state uh, agreements with Burmese State Councilor Ong San Suu Kyi. Uh, that meant Facebook users who translated headlines from local outlets would be treated to breaking news stories like uh, Dinner Honors present President Mr. Shithole. <laughs> <laughs> Meanwhile, Sue Kui's official Facebook page was filled with the obscenity as she posted about her time with Z. Facebook system didn't uh, didn't have did not have President Xi Jinping's name in its Burmese database, leaving the site to guess the translation. The company said in a statement, testing the translations of similar words starting with Z and S-H-I, brought up the same shithole results it added. We fixed a technical issue that caused the incorrect translations from, from Burmese to English on Facebook. Uh, this should not have happened, and we are taking steps to ensure it doesn't happen again. We sincerely apologize to Mr. Shithole uh, for the offense this has caused. <laughs> <laughs> Poor Mr. Shithole. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> and finally, lastly, and, and quite well, maybe leastly, but just in case any of y'all out there are fans of either Jelly Bellies or Sparkling Waters, Seltzers, on on WISN.com, posted on January 21st, Jelly Belly releases a sparkling water that tastes just like jelly beans. Get in my belly. <laughs> there, are, there are all sorts of alcoholic seltzers and a new line of uh, Coca-Cola seltzers set to hit the shelves in March of 2020. And now, a new effervescent beverage is here to change the game. Jelly Belly Sparkling Water. Just uh, just because the name suggests it will be a super sugary drink, based off the beloved jelly beads, of course, does not mean that's true. These seltzers are going to have zero calories and zero sweeteners and will only use two ingredients. The cans will begin to stock the shelves next week, and the drink comes in eight of the iconic Jelly Belly Bean flavors. Uh, you can take your pick between French vanilla, lemon lime, orange sherbet, pina colada, pink grapefruit, tangerine, very cherry, or watermelon. Each flavor is made only with carbonated water and natural flavors, so you can have a taste of the candy jar with zero calories. According to a press release, the initial launch of Jelly Belly Sparkling Water will reach up to 265 stores across eight Midwestern states. You're in luck, Moose Girl. <laughs> and use, use over there in Ohio. We know who you are. The, the brand already has an eye on what's next, considering there are over 100 different flavors of Jelly Belly to pull inspiration from. Ooh, Jelly Belly Water. Mm-mm-mm. 
<laughs> all right, folks, thank you all so much for tuning in to, to tonight's Grim Leftovers program. <coughs> and let me remind you, finally, once again, it is donation month here at reallibertymedia.com. So please head on over to the site, click the donation button, and send a few bucks our direction. Appreciate it very much. We've got lots of great shows lined up out for you throughout the week. There's one show at least every day. Uh, so uh, check tomorrow at 3 p.m. Eastern is In a Perfect World, Philosophizing Freedom with Flash Somebody and probably Gramsci as a co-host. We'll see as that, how that comes up. But, uh, yeah, hit the uh, the pop-up schedule button there on reallibertymedia.com. Thank you so much. I'll be back next week with another episode for you all. Have a great week. Peace.